Welcome to the third of three lectures on Perry's A Dialogue on Personal Identity and Immortality. We rejoin Gretchen, our dying philosophy professor, Sam and Dave, her friends that are attempting to convince her that her identity can survive bodily death. The group has considered the importance of having a properly acquired memory, that is a memory that's the result of actual events that have actually occurred to that particular person, the importance of anticipation, that is the disposition toward events that one expects to experience in the future, the importance of continuity, that is of having a stream of consciousness that is continued from one event to the next, to the next, to the next, and also the importance of singularity, that is that there will be only one of you and that singularity of identity is integral to the concept. The group finally gives us a hint that this conversation has been fictional all along because they speak of the curious case of Julia North, and I'll read you an account of that case. Julia North's body was crushed by a streetcar while saving a child who, was, who had wandered onto the tracks. The child's mother, Mary Frances Bodine, suffered a stroke, a stroke at the side of the event. Both Julia and Mary Frances were taken to a nearby hospital where the brilliant neurosurgeon, Dr. Matthews, performed a body transplant whereby Mary Frances' healthy body was matched with Julia's healthy brain. And so you've got a lady who saves a child from being crushed by a streetcar. She herself is crushed by the streetcar. And the child's mother has a stroke. I'm not sure if people have strokes based on trauma. I thought that was more of a heart attack type thing. But this is, of course, a fictional account from a book called Who is Julia? But in any case, Dr. Matthews, who has a very wonderful name, conjoins the brain of Julia with the body of Mary Frances. And so the question becomes, and it's very relevant for the group's conversation, who is this person that is the result of Julia's physical brain and Mary Frances's physical body? Well, we found out from the group that in the book, Who is Julia?, Mary Frances's husband thinks that the resulting person is in fact Mary Frances. But the Supreme Court rules, and of course the Supreme Court is fallible, that the person is Julia. And so this, of course, is something that uh, maybe science can do someday. It can't do it right now. But if it could do this, it's an important question. Who would that person be? And so now Gretchen makes a dramatic revelation. And that dramatic revelation is, shortly after she had her accident, Dr. Matthews approached her and offered to perform the exact same procedure. He said that he had a donor body that he would be willing to transplant to her brain or her brain to the body, however you like to look at that. But Gretchen refused and said that she would rather die because she identifies with her body. And now it becomes clear how much Gretchen identifies with her body, not just with her physical brain, but the totality of her body from head to toe. Gretchen thinks that that is who she is. And so if her brain were to be transplanted into another person's body, that entity, the resulting entity, may be alive, but it wouldn't be Gretchen, and Gretchen wants Gretchen to survive bodily death. At least that's her conception of identity. And so the group also considers something called brain rejuvenation, and I'll read what I understand that procedure to be, though I found the account of it in the book just a little bit confusing. So with brain re rejuvenation, a person's brain is physically duplicated, capturing all memories and psychological states, but things such as blood vessels are bolstered to a healthy state to the benefit of stroke victims and sufferers of different brain injuries. Gretchen, however, argues that recipients of this procedure do not retain their identity, for if one duplicate brain can be created, 50 can be created, and identity requires that there be only one. On Gretchen's view, identity of the person requires identity of the brain, or as I might say, on Gretchen's view, identity of the person requires singularity of the brain. And so on this brain rejuvenation, you can make more brains, and you've got the same memories and such, but this is similar to the idea they considered previously that what if God could have a new body for us in heaven waiting for us, and they discount that because, well, if he can have one body waiting for us, he can have several, and if that's the case, that wouldn't it, none of those bodies would be us because there's only one us, and identity is uh, necessarily, it necessarily implies singularity. And so Dave makes a passionate case here at the end of the book for Gretchen to take Dr. Matthews up on his offer and actually undergo the body transplant. And he's making his plea, and they're, they're continuing the conversation, and it's getting really heated. Uh, and just as they seem to be making a little bit of progress, they realize that Gretchen is, is gone. She uh, has just passed. And so the book ends with Gretchen dying. And so here is a brief overview of the main concepts that are considered in the book in the group's conception of identity that they consider. 
And so first of all, that properly acquired memory, a memory is the result of actual events. It's not the result of uh, mistaken memories. No one's implanted this stuff in your head with a, a microchip. No evil genius is tricking you into thinking that you are who you are, but you actually have experienced those events. This correct disposition of anticipation toward future events that if you've got something coming up next week that you're excited about, I'm, I'm excited later this afternoon about a, uh, a particular football game I'd like to watch. Um, you would expect a person to have those sorts of dispositions if they were, in fact, that person. Continuity, that is, consciousness that continues from event to event over time. And last, singularity. And so these are all different components of a conception of identity that the group entertains. And so you need to think, are these components that make sense? Are these components that necessarily need to be built into a conception of identity? And more importantly, what's your conception of identity? And we'll get to that in just a second. But also something we considered earlier, last chapter, and I think actually I hinted at it, well, actually we talked about it in chapter one, the very first night, and that is Cartesian dualism. And this is the view that the mind and the body are made up of different substances, that they interact, that the mind has some impact on the body, but the body is physical, it's material, and the brain is non-physical and immaterial. And so this opens the possibility, perhaps, that our consciousness or our mind could somehow continue after our body has died and rotted and deteriorated. It seems to be the case that our consciousness and our mind is dependent upon our physical body. That is, when we're little babies and our brains aren't very developed, we can't think very clearly, we can't have very complex thoughts. As our brain develops and gets stronger, we can have more powerful thoughts and a more developed identity. And as we get older and our brain deteriorates, our ability to think also deteriorates. And it's also the case that if we are under the influence of different mind-altering drugs, that impacts our ability to think. You might just think about the impact of alcohol on cognition. And so you've got a physical impact on our physical brains, which has a direct impact on our experience and our consciousness, which implies that our consciousness is somewhat dependent upon our physical brains. But dualism opens up the possibility, at least, that our mind could survive outside of our body, perhaps with another body linked up in some other way. And so the last thing I want you to consider, and the most important thing I want you to consider from this entire book is, what is your conception of identity? What do you think are the important factors, the important ideas that need to be built into that concept? Do you think that a properly acquired memory is necessary? Do you think that that disposition and anticipation is necessary? Do you think continuity is necessary? Is singularity necessary? Think about that. What makes the most sense? Don't just pick items from a list and don't just buy all of this because some philosophy professor happened to write this book and some people fictionally thought through it. Think about what makes the most sense. And then also, very, very important, does this conception survive bodily death? Can it survive bodily death? And if so, if you think so, how is that the case? And make sure that your conception of identity meshes with your conception of survival, whatever that is. That's your discussion question. Thanks so much for engaging me in this very interesting conversation.